Welcome to Justice Trek. My name is Ted Kilvington, and this is an audio and video log that journeys through comic book history as I discuss individual comic book stories of Star Trek, the Justice Society, and the world's greatest superheroes, the Justice League of America. Justice Trek is the only show devoted to the entirety of these great comic book series. From the 1940 debut of the JSA, the launch of the JLA and Star Trek comic books in the 1960s, and right up to comics hot off today's shelves. This show will impact you in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Hey everybody, I'm Ted Killington. Welcome to Justice Trek episode 15. Today's episode, I will be covering 2022's The New Golden Age, number one from DC Comics. Uh, now, uh, for those of you who have been uh, following along, or you haven't been following along, um, what I do on the show is um, I cover alternate between Star Trek episodes and Justice episodes. This is a Justice episode where I talk about Justice League and Justice Society comics. Uh, I've covered uh, comics from uh, the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, and uh, uh, now I'm going to cover a comic from the uh, recent past of 2022. This comic was published uh, just uh, in, in well, November, I'm filming this in June, so uh, about seven months ago. Not exactly hot off to the t today's shelves, but uh, we're working our way there. Don't worry about it. We will be hot off today's shelves one of these hot days. Um, just a reminder, also available for your uh, viewing pleasure, we have uh, previous episodes. Episode 13, where I discussed um, Crisis from Tomorrow. From 1978's Justice League of America, number 160, guest starring Ross Aitken of the Stop, Let's Team Up podcast. Um, and that was the second part of the 1978 JLA JSA team up. Um, also, we have episode uh, 14, where I talked about the haunting of the Enterprise from 1980s, Star Trek number five from Marvel Comics. Uh, just want to apologize. I had a lot of stuff going on in my personal life, I, so I had to take a week off. So um, don't worry, I'm still making episodes. But uh, eh, you know, life goes on, and uh, uh, stuff happened, and now it's happening here. Um, hey, if you like what you're seeing, please click like. Please click subscribe. Got a lot to talk about, so let's get on with the show. So this is my reference copy. It's the standard cover. Uh, first read it when I bought it, uh, got in November of 19, or November of 2022. Uh, um, now I actually get my comic books through mail order. So I basically receive one batch at the end of every month. So since this came out on, uh, uh, early November, I didn't actually read it until after it had been out on the, out for a few weeks. But, uh, I read it now, that was seven months ago and let's talk about it. A uh, bit of background information. Uh, the Justice Society first debuted in All-Star Comics number three, published on November 22nd, 1940. And I went into great detail uh, about that comic on the third episode of this show. Uh, the JSA appeared uh, throughout the 1940s. Uh, and through the end of the year 1950, uh, then they took off the rest of the decade. Uh, then they next appeared in 1963's uh, The Flash, number 137, that would appear, uh, or then they would have gone to appear in many issues of the Justice League of America, uh, All-Star Squadron, and back in a revived All-Star comics uh, for throughout the Silver and Bronze Age of comics. Uh, however, uh, in 1986, after the crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, they went into limbo, literally and figuratively, uh, and they were not seen again until 1992's Armageddon Inferno number four. 
the uh, um, after that, they appeared for a couple of years, and they were uh, killed off during Zero Hour. Someone said, "Oh, nobody wants to read about old timey characters." Uh, well, they were wrong. A lot of us love to read about old timey characters. In '99, they relaunched the JSA, uh, and uh, that series uh, and the subsequent series uh, called Justice Society of America. Uh, continued all the way up till 2011's Flashpoint event. During the New 52, the Justice Society made no appearances, not once, during the New 52. Now, many certain versions of some of the characters, members of the Justice Society and their uh, associates, did make appearances in the Earth 2 Earth 2 World's End and Earth 2 Society comics that DC was publishing. However, not once in any of those Earth 2 books did the phrase Justice Society ever appear. So, while it had characters similar to the JSA characters, it was not Justice Society because they didn't even call themselves Justice Society. Uh, when the DC Rebirth initiative began in 2016, the JSA and their members would appear again uh, over the next few years, but very sparingly, um, uh, until the comic we're talking about today. Uh, this issue was published towards the end of DC's latest history-altering event, Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths. Specifically, it was published on the exact same day as Dark Crisis number six. The final issue of Dark Crisis and several tie-ins would be published over the next six weeks. However, this story does take place after the events of Dark Crisis number seven, which explained the latest version of DC Comics characters' history. So, um, roll call in order of appearance. There's the Huntress, Helena Wayne, Per Degaton, the Adam, Al Pratt, the Sandman, Wesley Dodds. The Spectre, Jim Corrigan. The Flash, Jay Garrick. The Hawkman, Carter Hall. Dr. Fate, Kent Nelson. The Green Lantern, Alan Scott. The Our Man, Rex Tyler. If you're wondering why I'm pronouncing the, the hero names that way with the, it's because that's how they were originally uh phrased uh, when they first appeared in 1940. So it wasn't our man, it was the space our dash man. So he wasn't our man, he was the our man. Also, we have Johnny Thunder. Yes, folks, that's his real name. There's the Boom, Judy Garrick, Salem the Witch Girl, uh, Salem Rula Nader, Cherry Bomb, Gloria James, Betsy Ross, Elizabeth Rose, Molly Pitcher, Molly Preacher, The Harlequin's Son, Michael Maine, John Henry Jr., John Henry Irons, Ladybug, Rosabel Rivera, Quiz Kid, Raghu Sitaraman, The Green Lantern of 3022, The Doctor Fate of 3022, a woman named Sophie. The Atom of 3022. Dr. Midnight, Dr. Charles McNighter. The Star Spangled Kid, Sylvester Pemberton. Power Girl, Kara Zorel, aka Karen Starr. Dr. Fate, Khalid Nasur. Detective Chimp, Bobo the Chimpanzee. Wild, Charles Wild. Blue Devil, Dan Cassidy. Doiby, Charles Dickles. The Red Lantern, Vladimir Sokov. Black Canary, Dinah Drake. Wonder Woman, Princess Diana. Batman, Bruce Wayne. Catwoman, Selena Kyle. Corky Baxter. John Wilkes Booth. That's right, John Wilkes Booth. The John Wilkes Booth. Ripley Hunter. 
Bonnie Baxter, Jeff Smith, Marionette, Erica Manson, Mime, Marcos Maez, Anita Maez, Nostalgia, Cleopatra Pack, The Watchman, Clark Dryberg, Silk Spectre, Sally Dryberg, Night Owl, Dan Dryberg, Dead Man, Boston Brand, and Rorschach, Reggie Long. Okay. The new Golden Age number one, published on November 8th, 2022, had a $4.99 cover price. The new Golden Age was actually the title of the story, which was 36 pages long. Jeff Johns was the writer. Rob Lay was the letterer. Marquis Andrew Marino uh, was the editor. Uh, the pencil and ink art credits include Diego Orotrogui, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing anyone's name, uh, J.P. Meyer, Scott Hanna, Jerry Ordway, Steve Lieber, Todd Nock, uh, Scott Collins, Victor Bogdanovic, uh, Brandon Peterson, and Gary Frank. The color art credits include Nick Fellardi, John Kalish, Matt Herms, Jordan Boyd, and Brad Anderson. It is November 22nd, 10 years from now. Outside Gotham Elementary School, a girl named Helena Wayne is playing with her friends at recess when she spies a mysterious red-haired man observing her from across the street. This is not the first time Helena has seen the creeper stranger, so she runs back into her school building. November 22, 1940. At the very first meeting of the Justice Society of America, founding members, the Atom, the Sandman, the Spectre, the Flash, the Hawkman, Dr. Fate, the Green Lantern, and the Our Man pose for a photo that will be taken by their young friend known as Johnny Thunder. The heroes then discuss their personal lives, including the possibilities of some of having children someday. Um, but all of a sudden, Dr. Fate is struck by an intense and painful vision of the same stranger that stalked Helena in their distant future. And several other costume children were also in Fate's vision. November 22nd, 3022. In the headquarters of the Justice Society, which had been abandoned for centuries, the Green Lantern, Dr. Fate, and Adam of that year are exploring the place when the stranger shows up and brutally murders Dr. Fate. In 1940, the Dr. Fate of that time recovers from his painful vision as he recounts what he saw for his teammates, even though the stranger is but a blurry image to him. November 22nd, 1976, Dr. Midnight performs a medical examination of Dr. Fate when the JSA's newest members, Power Girl and the Star Spangled Kid, show up. Power Girl angrily demands that she be allowed to go after the Justice so the Injustice Society, saying that the JSA doesn't want a powerful woman like her. But Dr. Fate assures her that the team definitely wants to train a new generation of heroes to carry on their legacy. In the present, young Khalid Nasur walks to the Oblivion Bar with Detective Chimp. Just as the bar's bouncer, the bear-like metahuman known as Wild, refuses entrance to Bobo, Khalid turns into Dr. Fate and recounts a vision he is having of someone breaking his neck. In 3022, the stranger, having just killed the Dr. Fate of that time, proceeds to kill that era's Green Lantern and Adam. In 1940, Alan Scott is walking down the streets of Gotham with his friend Doiby Dickles when he sees a newspaper headline about his Soviet rival, the Russian man known as the Red Lantern. In 1951, Justice Society members Adam, Black Canary, Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, Hawkman, Flash, and Dr. Midnight testify at an investigative hearing held by the U.S. Congress. Ten years from now, young Helena hears a sound in her home late one night and, fearing the stranger she saw at her school might be coming into her home, she quietly grabs a knife, makes her way to the intruder, stabs him! only to discover that the intruder is not the stranger. The intruder, or the, the, the person she heard, was her father, the Batman. 
13 years ago, Catwoman attempts to steal some Egyptian artifacts from a museum when Dr. Fate shows up and tries to stop her. Catwoman then tries to use her whip to swipe Dr. Fate's helmet off of his head, but instead creates a mystic backlash that leads Fate to see a vision of the dead bodies of many versions of him. Catwoman uses a distraction to escape with the artifacts, but Dr. Fate is able to warn her that the stranger will kill her daughter when she joins the Justice Society. Ten years from now, Batman gives his daughter Helena a tour of the Batcave when Helena's mother, the former Catwoman, shows up and angrily tells Batman that she doesn't want her daughter to become a superhero and die like many of his former Robin sidekicks. On April 2nd, 1848, young Corky Baxter of the Time Masters talks with a young John Wilkes Booth, telling him not to assassinate anyone in the future, when the other Time Masters arrive to pick up Corky. As the Time Masters journey through the time stream, Rip Hunter informs the team that some of the 13, the children, were lost before they could be reintegrated into the 1940s. Rip also says that they will be dropping Corky off in the 21st century before they go looking for a boy named Dryberg before anyone else, such as uh, Dryberg's biological parents uh, or Ozymandias' fangirl or Rorschach finds him. 18 years from now, a 17-year-old Helena and her mother experience the death of Batman when the Justice Society arrives to inform and console them. Helena then vows to become the Huntress, whether her mom wants her to or not. That is the end of the new golden age, number one. All right. Uh, that was, a lot happened, a lot to unpack. So... I'm going to uh, show the credits. I like to show the credits in the middle of the episode so people stick through them. Come back, and I've got a very detailed page-by-page -page analysis of all 48 uh, pages of this issue's content. Now, notice I said the story was 36 pages long, but there's 48 pages of content that I'm going to discuss. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, find out after the credits. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to send them to me on Twitter under the handle at Justice Trek or via email at thejusticetrek at gmail.com. Be sure to include the word the at the beginning of the email address. For research purposes, I rely heavily on dc.fandom.com, memory-alpha.fandom.com, comicvine.gamespot.com, the Grand Comics Database at comics.org, and Mike Boyle's website, Mike's Amazing World of DC Comics at dcindexes.com. The opinions expressed are solely those of the host and any participants. This podcast is not a commercial enterprise and does not make any money. All copyrights are held by their respective owners. The opening sequence was animated by Craig Smith of Phoenix Studios. The opening music is Dragon Slayer by the Mackay Symphony. All music used is either public domain and or not protected by copyright. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Hey, thanks for coming back. Glad you uh, thought enough of the show to stick around. Uh, glad you thought enough of the show to tune in. Uh, hope you like it. If you do, click like, click subscribe. I appreciate that there's an infinite amount of ways you could be spending your time. And, that I, and I definitely appreciate that of all the many choices, you chose to take the time to listen to, to me talk about my passions, JLA, JSA, and Star Trek. Um, so, back to the new golden age, number one. The primary cover was penciled, inked, and colored by Mikkel Jenin. Uh, it shows Flash, Green Lantern, Power Girl, Hawkman, uh, the Thomas Wayne Batman, 
Dr. Fate, and Hawk Girl in a swirling vortex. At the center of the vortex are Star Girl, Huntress, the Yolanda Montez Wildcat, who doesn't appear in the story, the Beth Chapel Dr. Midnight, who doesn't appear in the story, nor does nor, nor I don't even think Star Girl appears, um, Joaquin Thunder, who doesn't appear, and his Thunderbolt. Um, inside a transparent time bubble are the Time Masters Rip Hunter, Bonnie Baxter, Jeff Smith, and Quirky Baxter. Uh, the first variant cover was penciled, inked, and colored by J. Hero. It shows the Khalid Nasur Dr. Fate surrounded by images of other Dr. Fates. The second variant cover was by Todd Nock, pencil and ink artist, and Matt Hearns, color artist. It shows the Spectre, Stripesy, Our Man, Dr. Fate, Mr. Terrific, Crimson Avenger, and the Human Bomb standing over Star Girl, Quiz Kid, Salem the Witch Girl, Cherry Bomb, Wing, Tick Tock, and The Secret. The third variant cover was by Mike Allred, pencil and ink artist, and Laura Allred, color artist. Uh, it shows Batman attached to the outside of Rip Hunter's time sphere as it travels through the time stream. There is also a virgin foil ver version of this cover. I always team seem to trip over the words virgin version. There was a virgin version of me once. Oh. Um, the fourth variant cover is penciled, inked, and colored by David Talaski and shows the Ellen Scott uh, Green Lantern against a black background. There is also a virgin foil version of this cover. There's never a virgin foil version of me, though. Hmm. Um, the final variant cover is penciled, inked, and colored by Dan Hip and shows Dr. Fate, Hawkman, Hawk Girl, Flash, Wildcat, Star Girl, Black Canary, and Green Lantern sitting on an apartment stoop. Uh, the issue doesn't actually mention. Which pencil, ink, and color artists did which of the uh, pages? I'm if I do, if I'm, if I'm pretty sure who uh, was the art team for a particular page, I will mention it. Um, and, and I'm going to guess uh, they followed the standard procedure of having like each page will be penciled, inked, and colored. Um, by the same team throughout. So in other words, if Jerry Ordway is doing art on one page, the same uh, person, if he's doing the pencil art on a page, then the same person will be inking him and the same person will be coloring him on every page throughout the issue where his artwork appears. That's my guess. Again, I couldn't actually find versions to confirm it, but that's, that's the way these things are usually handled these days. Um, now, this book has no ads on the interior pages, so $4.99 for 48 pages of content is pretty good these days. There were ads on the inside front cover for the Stargirl TV show, uh, the inside back cover for the Pennyworth TV show, and on the back cover for the Black Adam movie. Okay, page one. I would guess Helena is about nine years old in this 10 years from now sequence. This would imply that she will be conceived and birthed within the next year. Uh, this page doesn't mention Helena's last name. So at first, some readers might be confused or, or they might wonder, hey, is this the Helena Wayne Huntress or is this the Helena Bertinelli Huntress? Um, as you may recall, after, after the uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, when they said, um, that Batman never had a daughter. They created a new version of Huntress with the same first name, Helena, only in that one, they said she was the daughter of a mobster named Bertinelli. Page two. Helena and her friends made snow angels on the playground, but somehow Helena's snow angel looks like it has bat ears. I mean, there weren't even any, you know, things sticking up on her uh, wool cap to indicate that, 
you know, something, that, something that might cause the ears. I mean, yeah, I get the angel wings can be similar to bat wings, but uh, yeah, a bit of a stretch there. Page three. Helena calls her stalker uh, the stranger, but if by the end of the issue, it will be revealed that it is, in fact, a longtime Justice Society foe per decaton. Uh, and he, obviously, he's a supervillain. We see him killing people. He's not a nice guy. But, to, you know, just seeing him creep on uh, a nine-year-old girl, I don't know. That, that's a little too real, <laughs> if you, you know what I mean. Uh, that's like, I like the, the fantasy aspects of, you know, JLA, JSA, and Star Trek. So that's, uh, I mean, yeah, obviously that stuff happens in the real world. My wife, we used to run the Michigan State Police Sex Offender uh, Registry Unit. So yeah, we know all about uh, uh, creeps, believe me. I used to, I worked 19 years for Michigan State Police criminal records. Believe me, we know about creeps. And that's one of the reasons why we like the fantasy world where we don't have to deal with creeps as much as we do in the real world. That's my take on it. Back to the fantasy. Page four. Uh, the 1940 sequence was penciled by Jerry Ordway, and I'm going to guess inked by him also. Um, this full page image is an homage to the cover of All Star Comics number three, uh, the very first appearance of the Justice Society, which was published on November 22nd, 1940. That's why the date November 22nd appears throughout the issue uh, is because it's an homage to that first JSA story. Um, Johnny Thunder uh, was in that first issue as a guest star. Um, he would not join the team until issue number six. So it was a good touch to have him be the one to take the photo. Page five. The Sandman says that he dreamed that the Justice Society would have many more members. I think the notion that Wesley Dodd can have dreams about the future, you know, dream recognition, uh, I don't think that actually was a thing until the Neil Gaiman Sandman series. Uh, if you um, think, if that, if you know of any evidence that Wesley Dodd had recognition dreams before Neil Gaiman Sandman, um, let me know on Twitter or on Facebook or send me an email to thejusticetrek at gmail.com. Um, the Adam asks Dr. Fate how many kids he will have with a girl he has a crush on. And after some pestering, Fate tells him, at least one. It seems a little inappropriate for me to, uh, you know, for, for Dr. I think it's inappropriate for Dr. Fate to tell the Adam that he won't have children with this girl that he hasn't even dated yet. I mean, come on, buy a girl a drink first. Uh, during the 1990s, it was revealed that the Grant Emerson version of Damage was actually Al's son, but by that time, Al Pratt had died during the 1994 Zero Hour event. Page six. Uh, despite being the vision of the 1940 Dr. Fate, this page is not drawn by Jerry Ordway, but I can't tell who the artist is. Uh, I'm going to guess Todd Nock, uh, since the page focuses on the lost children from the upcoming series Stargirl, The Lost Children, which was penciled by Nock. Uh, Dr. Fate's vision uh, depicted on this full page image includes Degaton. The Boom, John Henry Jr., Quiz Kid, Ladybug, Molly Pitcher, Betsy Ross, Cherry Bomb, Salem the Witch Girl, and several other characters who are not named in this issue. Page 7. Dr. Fate's helmet is as hot as a stovetop, and he is sputtering in agony. Page 8. A full-page image of the ruins of the JSA headquarters 1,000 years from our present. I don't know who did the art for this sequence. Um, I would probably be giving more compliments to the art if I knew who it was I should be complimenting. Uh, I mean, hey, Todd Nock uh, was great on Young Justice, uh, great on the, the Stargirl uh, miniseries. Uh, Jerry Ordway, of course, I've always loved him on uh, All-Star Squadron, Infinity Incorporated. 
uh, Adventures of Superman, uh, uh, Power of Shazam, and uh, per Wild Star. Pretty much anything I can think of he's drawn, I've liked. I can't, I can't think of anything uh, uh, he's ever done that I disliked. Um, but for the other artists, you know, it's they, they did great work. I got nothing bad to say about any of the art in this issue. Uh, it's all top notch. Uh, but I just like would like to be able to say, "Great drawing, Diego!" If I knew which were drawings were Diego's. Uh, let's see, page nine. The Justice Society of America of the 31st century confirms that this is the same timeline as the Legion of Superheroes. This was the first time that it was ever mentioned that there was a JSA at the time of the Legion. Page 10. Although they show the Atom, uh, at first I thought this character was some version of Blue Beetle, because to me, he looks more like the Jaime Reyes version of Blue Beetle than he does any version of the Atom that's ever appeared. Also, uh, we don't really learn anything about the identities of the members of the Justice Society of the 31st century, other than Dr. Fate's name is Sophia. Uh, page 11. The breaking of Dr. Fate's neck by Dagaton is depicted very brutally. I mean, it is just sickening to watch. You know, I mean, I, I know earlier I talked about, you know, like the, 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 the creepy way Dagaton was stalking Helena. Um, but this is, it, 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 it's sick. And another thing to remember, to, 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 this brings to mind is, Degaton was never a hand-to-hand -hand combatant. In all his previous appearances, he used various time travel gimmicks to take on the JSA or the All-Star Squadron, um, or even the Justice Society, um, Infinity Incorporated. But he never was a hand-to-hand -hand combatant. And now he shows up and he's powerful enough to brutally murder a Dr. Fate with his bare hands. And then, of course, later he'll proceed to take on uh, Green Lantern and Adam and kill them as well. So this is a very, very different version of Per Dagaton than we've seen before. Uh, also, on page 12, the uh, depiction of Dagaton here, it, it looks younger than it, it, he did in the uh, previous images. Now, is that merely an artistic choice? Or will that age difference... Uh, have future story implications. Guess we'll just have to wait and see. Page 13. Back in the 1940s, Kent Nelson has his helmet off as he recovers from his vision, and he mentions that he never wants to put on the helmet of Naboo again, but he often feels a responsibility to do so. Page 14. I don't know who illustrated the 1976 sequence. Uh, the Kent Nelson of that time says that he remembers the death of his 31st century counterpart. Now, there is a footnote, which is unusual for this issue. Because there weren't a lot of footnotes, but this footnote says that this sequence here uh, takes place just after the JSA fought Vulcan in All-Star Comics number 61, which was published in April of 1976. On page 15, uh, Power Girl and the Star Spangled Kid had just joined the JSA at the end of All-Star number 59. Uh, so the Vulcan fight was actually their first uh, time uh, that they had fought as members of the JSA. Uh, Power Girl is depicted as angry, and to me, it seems even angrier than uh, she usually was at the time. I mean, one of the things that they did in her initial appearance is they kind of played off. Now, the 70s was, you know, part of the women's liberation movement. And I don't mean to sound pejorative. I'm just saying at the time, uh, in American society, uh, women's contributions uh, and capabilities were severely downplayed in culture up until around the year 1970. And then um, some... Uh, women, uh, 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 most famously uh, Gloria Steinem um, and Betty Friedan and others, they uh, pioneered what is now known as women's liberation, which is basically to say that women's uh, cultural contributions and their women's capabilities should not be minimized. In fact, they should be accepted, encouraged, and celebrated. Um, 
unfortunately, uh, uh, the regressives in society, uh, you know, l like to make a caricature out of feminism, and to the point where even you know women who are very empowered, you know, like they say, "Oh, I'm not a feminist," and it's like, well, if you believe women are equal, then you more or less are a feminist. Uh, that's basically what it's all about: is saying, "Hey, women's contributions and capabilities are just as important and valuable." Uh, and uh, equal <laughs> as men's, okay? You know, it's, if you don't, you know, so that's basically what feminism is. It's not whatever the, the opponents of uh, feminism have made a ca the caricature out to be. But anywho, back to Power Girl. Um, the, the way you know, they were uh, trying to portray Power Girl is she was the, 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 the young woman who was voicing her opinion and not willing to take the, uh, the stereotypes handed to her uh, by the older members of the Justice Society. Uh, specifically, her foil was uh, Wildcat, and uh, Wildcat would make some r remarks that were mm, sexist or chauvinistic, or, uh, but they were often also just uh, uh, kind of ageist. And, you know, in other words, uh, he wasn't saying, he wasn't minimizing her accomplishments because she was a woman, he was minimizing her accomplishments because, hey, she's a brand new character. She'd never appeared before. You know, she's a uh, uh, still uh, wet behind the ears was, I believe, a, a term he used. So, um, uh, unfortunately, in our society, when somebody is subject to a lot of criticism, they often don't know how to separate uh, legitimate, you know, uh, criticism from um, the criticism that emerges from an illegitimate bias. You know, if... Um, you know, everyone's human, everyone makes mistakes. And if I say, hey, you made a mistake, you know, you, th that is, you know, if you actually did make a mistake, then that's not attributable to bias. Now, if I said, you made a mistake, imagine that, a woman made a mistake, uh, who, would, who could have predicted? Now, that, of course, would be chauvinistic, feministic, sexist, or anti-feministic, sexist, uh, however you want to put it. Um, I, I do like how Power Girl complains on this page that uh, the JSA doesn't want a powerful woman on the team. And then Dr. Fate points out that uh, Wonder Woman had been a member of the team for decades. Now, in the pre kind yeah, there's a powerful female that keeps walking back and forth behind me. Um, in the pre-crisis continuity, um, the Princess Diana Wonder Woman of Earth 2... Uh, joined the, the JSA uh, in story continuity uh, in late 1941. Um, in, in the actual issue was published in 42, um, but um, it was clearly it was set shortly after, like days after Pearl Harbor, and uh, which was December 7th, 1941. So in the 1942 issue, they said Wonder Woman joined uh, sometime between December 7th and December 31st of 1941. All right, All right. Um, and she was historically a member of the JSA right up until um, the JSA ended in uh, early 1986. Uh, specifically, in Crisis Number 12, one, the Earth 2 Wonder Woman traveled to Mount Olympus to live with the gods, with he, she and her husband, uh, Steve Trevor. And then, um, four, four months later, in the last days of the JSA uh, special, the JSA went off to limbo. So all, whether they were in Olympus or limbo, we were all dealing with uh, mythical gods in some way, shape, or form. Um, now, afterwards, in starting in uh, Legends number six, which it was published in January of '87, uh, they when one the post crisis version of Wonder Woman. This is neither the Earth One nor Earth Two. A Wonder Woman. This is a brand new Wonder Woman. They said this is the first time that any Wonder Woman had ever appeared in uh, man's world, you know, or, or patriarch's world, or however they termed it at the time. Uh, and therefore, there was never a Wonder Woman before that interacted with the DC Universe before 1987. Uh, then, after Zero Hour, um, in was stated uh, approximately 1998. Uh, that uh, Diana's mother, Queen Hippolyta of Themyscira, actually served as Wonder Woman in the Justice Society during World War II, uh, and uh, occasionally afterwards. Um, now, 
it looked to me, and comics.org does confirm it, that the Justice Society Wonder Woman in this continuity is back to being Princess Diana. So this is the first time we've seen, really, uh, uh, Princess Diana be a member of the Justice Society uh, in almost 40 years. Page 16. I don't know who drew this sequence, but it is set in the present. Uh, with the appearance of uh, the Khalid Nasur version, uh, we have our third Dr. Fate so far. Uh, page 17. Uh, I think this is the uh, first comic I've read with Wild uh, since he first appeared uh, back in uh, 1993's uh, Outsiders uh, Volume 2, Number 1. Now, uh, I never uh, read much Outsiders uh, after that first issue. Now, the, the Art and characters didn't grab me, and I wasn't really a big fan of, of Mike Barr's first uh, run of The Outsiders. I mean, that was the first comic I ever dropped by him because I thought the villains were too stupid. Um, uh, and, and it's not that you, stupid villains don't can't be entertaining. I mean, I thought it worked for Savage Dragon because of the world Eric Larson created in Savage Dragon, but I don't think the villains that Mike W. Barr was creating, like Force of July, uh, were... A good fit for the DC universe as it existed in 1984. I mean, trying to combine the seriousness of George Orwell with the goofiness of Fourth of July, to me, it just didn't work. Uh, there are other characters besides Blue Devil in the Oblivion Bar, but I, I, don't, I don't recognize them. Uh, when Khalid turns into Dr. Fate, his costume resembles Sophia's outfit from the 31st century more than it does the Kent Nelson version. Uh, page 18. In the year 3022, Degaton kills Green Lantern and Adam by turning the green fire from the magical power ring back on them. Uh, so this would also imply that Degaton uh, has his own magical power source um, and that his power is greater than that of Green Lantern's power ring. Page 19. In 1940, a newspaper headline said that the Red Lantern had destroyed a Navy ship, killing dozens. Now, the headline did not say to which country that Navy ship belonged. Um, in the real world, the U.S. was neither in a hot nor a cold war with the Soviet Union in 1940, and in fact, the two countries would ally themselves in just over a year to fight Nazi Germany. Uh, so it would be interesting to see, I mean, it, obviously it could have been a Nazi ship, but it doesn't actually say that, uh, for that matter. You know, the Soviet Union and Russia had a long historical enmity with Japan, so maybe the Red Lantern destroyed a Japanese ship. Uh, page 20. On this page, Jerry Ordway definitely drew the stranger to be per Degaton. It wasn't clear until this page that Degaton is the stranger. Uh, this page also transitions from uh, Degaton observing Green Lantern in the 1940s to Degaton observing the JSA before Congress in 1951. Page 21. Nine-year-old Helena appears especially determined, strong, and vicious as she shoves the knife into the intruder, who, of course, turns out to be her father. Page 22. There is a great full-page image of a bleeding Batman standing in front of the grandfather clock in stately Wayne Manor. Uh, the clock, that clock, usually hides the entrance uh, to the Batcave. Now, Batman is bleeding out of the side of his torso, a place that usually isn't uh, protected by a bulletproof vest. Uh, it reminds me of the scene in the 1992 Batman Returns uh, film uh, when uh, Catwoman... Uh, sliced uh, Batman on the side of his torso. So here we have the Catwoman's daughter slicing Batman in the side of the torso. <laughs> Page 23. It is a weird image to focus on the bloody knife laying on the counter of the Wayne Manor kitchen. I love that Helena's first reaction when her dad tells her that he's Batman is to ask, Does Mom know? Page 24. I can't tell who did the art for the 13 years ago sequence, 
But it does appear that Catwoman is depicted in a fashion similar to how artist David Mazzuccelli uh, drew her in the 1987 story arc, Batman Year One. Also, the uh, Sophia Doctor Fate from the year 3022 mentioned the goddess Hahet, and the exhibit at the museum that Catwoman is robbing is for Hahet's artifacts. Will that have future story implications? We'll have to wait and see. Page 25. The illustration of what happens when Catwoman connects her whip to Fate's helmet is especially impressive. Pages 26 and 27. Here we have an awesome M.C. Escher homage to, uh, uh, you know, the, of the endless staircases. Um, I, one time when I was in college, I had uh, this guy who sat in front of um, uh, my um, a math course that I was taking. Uh, he, he, every time we had a test, he would wear his lucky M.C. Escher shirt. And it would always distract me from the test. I'm like staring at the M.C. Escher images on the back of his shirt. And it was like distracting me because I'd much rather... <laughs> I'm not a math guy. I'd much rather want, uh, stare at an M.C. Escher image than stare at an algebra equation. Um, so it was, I, I did mention to him later on that perhaps for my benefit, he could wear a different shirt when he took tests. I don't know how much the lucky shirt helped him. I don't even remember if he had heeded my requests uh, to, to wear a different shirt. But uh, that's M.C. Escher, Escher for you. Uh, now, there is one of the dead fates that we see on the homage is not a doctor. That would be the Jared Stevens character from the mid-1990s. We also see at least one doctor fate wearing the half helmet that he wore during his uh, most of his 1940s appearances. We see one version that looks like the Hector Hall uh, doctor fate from the 2000s. And finally, we see... Dagaton standing in the lower right corner, looking at all he has done. And I am guessing that this two-page spread uh, was done by Jerry Ordway. Now, uh, one of the ways I can best tell uh, artists apart is by looking at the way they draw faces. And this looks like a Dagaton, or this looks like an Ordway version of Dagaton. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean he drew it, or doesn't he, certainly doesn't mean he drew the whole thing, but it definitely looks to me like he drew that Dagaton. Um, but with Dr. Faye, the character whose face is obscured by the helmet, it's all, it's always much harder to, to tell um, who drew it. I mean, you have no, no, there's no facial expressions, there's no uh, lines and images, you know, shadows or whatever on the face to really give it that individual artistic touch that makes it easier to tell the different artists and even inkers apart. Uh, page 28. I would not have thought that Dr. Fate's helmet could be so easily removed. I would have thought there was some magic spell that uh, held it on or something. Page 29. Uh, in the transition from the previous page to this one, uh, Catwoman uh, says, uh, So don't you worry, Doc. Family's not in my future. We see on this page the glass cylinders displaying all of the costumes worn by the different Robins throughout the years. Uh, and, uh, of course, on this page we have uh, Selena with her family. Page 30. Selena and Bruce have both certainly aged well over the last 23 years. Uh, Selena makes a comment that implies that multiple Former Robins had tragic endings, saying, after what happened to Tim, Stephanie, Damien, even the Joker's son. Odd that you didn't mention anything about Jason Todd, who, of course, was the first Robin ever depicted to have died. Um, and this sentence was the first implication I could find that not only would the Joker have a son, uh, but that his son would become a Robin. Page 31. I don't know who drew the 1848 sequence. Uh, Corky is depicted wearing a Daniel Boone style coonskin hat, and DC.fandom.com says that Corky's hat is actually his pet, named Crockett the Raccoon. Uh, it is weird that Corky thought he could uh, change history by simply telling a 10 year old to not grow up to be an assassin. Yeah, because 10 year olds always grow up 
and avoid whatever it is they're told not to do. You know, when your mom tells you when you're 10, oh, when you grow up, uh, don't ever do anything that would uh, uh, make me embarrassed. And yeah, that, that, that usually doesn't last past the, the teenage years. Not that we always intentionally say got to do it, but very few of us when we're adults uh, uh, think back to uh, our 10 year old selves and say, what would my 10 year old self think of it? What would that complete stranger who talked to me when I was 10 years old, what would they think of my actions? Page 32. Of course, when Corky leaves John Wilkes Booth, all the young boy took away from the conversation is that the whole world would know his name. So, yeah, if you tell someone, oh, you're going to grow up to be famous for killing someone, so don't grow up and kill anyone, and they hear, you're going to grow up to be famous. Uh, this page was also the first reference to the 13, a group of people that were removed from history, but were going to be reintegrated into the 1940s. However, Rip said that the children from the 13 had gone missing before they could be reintegrated. Uh, this would be the Lost Children uh, from the Stargirl, The Lost Children miniseries. Uh, Rip says that the Time Masters have to find someone named Driver. Uh, page 33, we now have a one-page sequence uh, illustrated by Gary Frank. Uh, as far as I can tell, this is probably the only page he drew of the story, but Gary Frank was the artist of the Doomsday Clock uh, miniseries. And uh, uh, this page deals with the characters uh, from the Doomsday Clock. Uh, the characters that are actually are depicted are all ones uh, introduced in that issue by Gary Frank, or introduced in that series, by Gary, Frank, and uh, uh, Jeff Johns. Um, we don't actually see any of the characters created by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. Uh, we, we do, they are referred to in the dialogue. Uh, so like when I said that uh, Night Owl and Silk Spectre, they actually, we don't actually see them, we, but we do see a couple of their word balloons. Uh, on this page, we see Mary and Annette and the Mime as they paint a baby's nursery. Um, note that there is a mobile above the baby's crib consisting of the letters that spell out either watch men or watch man. Um, the second vowel isn't actually shown. Uh, now, according to dc.fandom.com, the baby is their daughter, Anita, uh, and they are the biological parents of a boy named Clark that was adopted by the Dryberg family in Doomsday Clock. Uh, the dialogue also implies that the woman walking with the genetically modified tiger known as Bubastis is Cleopatra Peck, who would become the vigilante Nostalgia, and who also debuted in Doomsday Clock. Uh, in the final panel on the page is a close-up of the Watchman, Clark Dryberg, to whom Dr. Manhattan transferred all of his power in the Doomsday Clock series. There are a couple of word balloons that apparently belong to the Watchman's adoptive parents, Dan Dryberg and his wife Sally. Um, you know, I, I've read the original Watchmen uh, twice. Uh, I read Doomsday Clock. Doomsday Clock uh, apparently didn't leave that much of an impression on me uh, because I didn't remember most of these details. That's why my source was dc.fandom.com. I mean, it, it was only been a few couple of years, you know, three, four years top since I read the story. And uh, yeah, I just, it, it uh, just didn't really uh, seem that memorable to me. You know, if you liked it, great. Uh, to me, you know, it just didn't didn't stick. I know uh, there was talk when Doomsday Clock was published about how it would set the template of the DC Universe going forward. Um, and it was published uh, around the same time as the 2017 crossover event Dark Knight's Metal. And Metal was so popular that it received a sequel crossover series. And it certainly, Metal certainly had a, a bigger impact packed on the publishing of DC Comics than the Doomsday Clock series did. Um, it's, well, you take it for what you will, but uh, uh, hopefully, I mean, I've, I've always loved Jeff Johns' work on JSA. Um, it's just, Doomsday Clock didn't really do much for me. Enough about that. Back to this. Page 34, uh, the final three pages all appear to be illustrated by the same artists, uh, even though multiple time sequences are shown. Um, we skip between a 17-year-old Helena Wayne hearing her mother yell, Oh, God, no! Uh, inside Wayne Manor, uh, there's a, 
an image of Dr. Chimp, Dr. or Dr. Chimp, Detective Chimp, Dr. Fate, and now we see Dead Man at the Oblivion Bar, and we also see the Time Masters in the Time Sphere in the Time Stream. Page 35. Here we have one scene with Selena standing at her front door getting bad news, another scene showing Catwoman at the museum 10 years ago, so these scenes are approximately um, 28 years apart. Uh, a close-up of the Reggie Long version of Rorschach, and an image of Batman lying dead in an alley. Finally, page 36. Now we see Selena in the arms of a very old Green Lantern, uh, along with Dr. Fate, a young woman wearing Jay Garrick's costume, and what appears to be an older Kara zor wearing a costume similar to Power Girl. Uh, Comics.org says that the, that the character is in fact Kara zor uh, who will be known as Power Woman at that time. Uh, they also say that the other female JSA member is Judy Garrick, The Flash. Now, uh, the only time I had seen Power Girl, uh, a grown-up version of Power Girl, uh, that was called Power Woman, was in the uh, 1996 Mark Wade Alex Ross uh, series uh, Kingdom Come, which depicted an alternate future version of DC with uh, uh, a grown-up Power Girl now calling herself Power Woman. And Judy Garrick, The Flash as you may recall from earlier, uh, is also Judy Garrick, the Boom. In the pre-crisis universe, Helena Wayne became the Huntress after her mother was killed, and in the new timeline, it will be her father's death that inspires her. So I thought that was a, a good uh, touch. Uh, it remains to be seen how they're going to integrate uh, this. I mean, are they just going to say it's an alternate timeline? Because I, I find it very unlikely that... Uh, um, DC plans on having Batman and Catwoman get married and have a child and give birth <laughs> anytime soon. Um, but uh, uh, that's certainly the implication of this story, and I don't know how they're going to resolve that dilemma. So, that's the end of the story pages. We've got a little more content for you. Okay, now, now this additional content comes in the page. Okay, now this additional content comes in the form of Who's Who style pages. Now, Who's Who, of course, was the uh, uh, directory of DC characters that was published in the mid-1980s, and they did sequel versions published in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, so these pages are done in that style. Uh, these are all versions for members of the 13. There's one page with has two characters on it, so that's how you get 12 pages with 13 characters. Um... Mo many of whom are seen or referred to in this issue. Um, not all of them, though. The, certainly the first and the last character of the, of the Who's Who listings were not seen or referred to in this issue. Um, the first one is the Golden Age Aquaman, uh, art by Jerry Ordway and John Kalish. Now, they do actually give art credits uh, for each individual uh, Who's Who page in the issue, just as they did on each individual who's who page from the original series in the mid 80s. Uh, the listing that we see here is very simple, uh, or simple, very similar to the sample who's who entry for the Aquaman of Earth 2 that was created by the uh, late podcaster Zoom Yukonori for the Fire and Water Podcast Network. I haven't heard of what plans are in store for the Golden Age Aquaman. Uh, the ver this version of Aquaman is more like a mutated human and is not from Atlantis, although he did, uh, they did show him spending much time in Atlantis while he was growing up. Uh, no real name is ever given for the character, although he once did use the alias Adam Waterman. Well, he was a Waterman. Um, now, and he, now, of course, all of these listings give, um, uh, first appearances of each character, but many of them never appeared before. Uh, most of them did. Aquaman is one that actually did first appear before, and that was in More Fun Comics 19, or More Fun Comics number 73, published in October of 1941. Um, actually, it was the, the same issue where Green Arrow first appeared. Uh, there, and I'll mention the other character when we get to him. Um, next up is a new pair of Betsy Ross and Molly Picture. Uh, the art is by Todd Nock and Matt Herms. Uh, now I'm so therefore I'm uh, extrapolating from this 
that uh, like John Kalish did the art or the color art for the Jerry Ordway sequences and uh, Matt Herms, uh, you know, inked the uh, Todd Nock art in those sequences. Uh, that's a speculation, not a, a, not a confirmation. Take it what you, for what you will. Uh, now, these characters are supposed to be uh, the sidekicks to Miss America. Um, the, you know, the gag here is that uh, uh, these were characters removed from DC history, um, but they're all brand new. Uh, so basically, this is John, Jeff Johns' way of um, inserting brand new characters into old continuity. Not that there's anything done with that. I mean, uh, that, that's you know always been a staple of well, pretty much all literature. Anytime somebody does a story with a fictional character set in the past, they're doing it. You know, it's um, you know whether it's um, I don't know the Scarlet Pimpernel or Zorro. Those stories weren't written contemporaneously. They were written about characters in the past. Um, and then what happens in, in comics, uh, the, the endless narrative mosaic that is comics continuity, um, you know, at some point a writer will say, hey, I like these, you know, old characters. Wouldn't it be neat if, uh, as, a, as a creative way of uh, shining a new light on these old characters, if we had a brand new character interacting with them? Sure, why not? If it's an entertaining story, why not? Um, so all of these who who pages give a, a supposedly first appearance of for you know, all the new characters, but since they're new, they're they're fake. They're all they're real comics, but the appearances are fake. So um, for this one, it says that they uh, first appeared in Military Comics issues six and seven, and um, I checked. I went to the Digital Comics Museum. Uh, and uh, confirmed that, no, Betsy and Molly did not actually appear in those stories. Uh, now, Betsy is actually Elizabeth Rose, and Molly Pitcher is Molly Preacher, and they're supposed to be the sidekicks of uh, Miss America. Uh, Miss America, uh, for what it's worth, was kind of, sort of considered a replacement uh, for Wonder Woman in the um, immediate post-crisis era. But uh, definitely, it was, it, was, it was mentioned in the late 80s, but it was, wasn't really referenced in the early 90s. And then we had Zero Hour, which did a, a continuity wipe. And then in the, uh, 1998, you know, they said, oh, well, Wonder Woman uh, was in the JSA as Queen Hippolyta uh, in, in the 1940s. And then when they brought back the JSA in 99, they said, well, hey... Um, they're, uh, uh, these are all the members that were, anyone who's ever been a member of the Justice Society, and there was no Miss America. So apparently her brief uh, continuity uh, impact on the Justice Society was limited to the late 80s, and never acknowledged since. Until perhaps this issue. I say perhaps, because we don't actually know how this will play out. Um, next up, we have... Cherry Bomb, art by Todd Nock and Matt Herm. So Todd Nock, uh, who was doing, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Star Girl, the Lost Children uh, series, he uh, is also penciling all of the lost children that are appearing uh, in this comic. Uh, all the, the, he's illustrating all the who's who uh, pages. Um, now, Gloria James is the sidekick to the Human Bomb, and she supposedly first appeared in Police Comics number one. The Harlequin Sun was by Jerry Ordway and John Kalish. Michael Maine was the son of Molly Maine, so we have two Mollies, and we, well, one character he uses Molly Payne for her real and fake identity, and another character that used Molly Payne as her real identity. Molly Payne Maine was the Golden Age Harlequin, and therefore her son is the Harlequin son. Uh, he supposedly first appeared in Infinity Incorporated, number one. Um, in the pre-crisis Teen Titans, there was a character called the Harlequin who claimed to be the Joker's daughter. So now we have another reversal here. So we used to have a Joker's daughter, now called the Harlequin. Now we have the Harlequin's son. Uh, John Henry Jr., art by Todd Nock and Matt Hearns. Uh, John Henry Irons wears a hood similar to the MLJ superhero, 
uh, the Black Hood, or the Watchmen character, Hooded Justice. Uh, who and, and um, uh, John Henry Jr. also has a hammer similar uh, to, or at least what looks similar to me, like Mjolnir. I mean, of course, it is a big hammer, so it, that that could be a coincidence. He may not have intended it to look like Mjolnir, and the inference may be mine, or maybe it was a subconscious thing on his part, or maybe it was intentional. But let me know what you think. Uh, this character's brother is the grandfather to the John Henry Irons uh, of the present, known as. Steel. Um, John Henry Jr. was not a sidekick. He uh, will probably never have a movie starring Shaquille O'Neal, and he supposedly first appeared in DC, The New Frontier, number six. Next up, we have The Boom! Art by Todd Nock and Matt Herms. Judy Garrick was the daughter of Flash J. Garrick and his wife, Joan. She inherited her father's super speed and supposedly first appeared in Flash Comics number 10. That was a definite retcon because uh, Flash, uh, of course, first appeared in Flash Comics number 1, and he definitely did not have a daughter 10 months later. Ladybug, art by Todd Nock and Matt Herms. Rosabel Rivera uh, was the sidekick to the Red Bee. Uh, she supposedly first appeared as Rosabel in Hit Comics number one, well, that was a quality comic, uh, as was the military comics with um, uh, Betsy Ross and Molly uh, Pitcher. Um, and um, Rosabel first appeared as Ladybug in Hit Comics number five, supposedly. Next, we have Red Lantern, art by Brandon Peterson. Uh, Vladimir Sokov was both an agent of communist Russia in the 1940s and an enemy of Green Lantern. Uh, just as Alan Scott had a daughter, Jade, who was born with the ability to wield a, his green flame, uh, Vladimir also had a daughter who was born with the ability to wield his crimson flame, although the whereabouts of Vladimir's daughter are currently unknown. And he supposedly first appeared in Green Lantern, Volume 1, Number 1. That's the 1941 Green Lantern, Volume 1, Number 1. Not to be confused with the Green Lantern uh, Volume 2, number 1, starring Hal Jordan. Uh, next, we have Mr. Miracle, art by Scott Collins and John Kalish. Besides the Golden Age Aquaman, this is the only other member of the 13 that was not a new creation. Um, he, uh, The Golden Age Mr. Miracle, a.k.a. Thaddeus Brown, actually did first appear in Mr. Miracle, Volume 1, number 1, created by Jack Kirby. Um, he was shown in that issue to be the uh, mentor to Scott Free after he uh, escaped from uh, Granny Goodness's uh, slave orphanage uh, on uh, the planet Apocalypse, escaped to Earth, uh, and he was taken in uh, by the escape artist, Mr. Miracle Thaddeus Brown, and trained to take over for him after he, uh, Mr. Brown died. Uh, next, we have Quiz Kid, art by Todd Nock and Matt Herms. Uh, Raghu Sitharaman was the sidekick of Mr. Terrific. Uh, he supposedly first appeared in Sensation Comics number 2. Salem the Witch Girl, art by Todd Nock and Matt Herms, based on Clarion the Witch Boy, also created by Jack Kirby. Uh, Salam Nadir was the sidekick to Dr. Fate. She supposedly first appeared in More Fun Comics number 56. Salam's entry is cute because she supposedly inserted comments into her personal data, such as marital status, single, forever, known relatives, none I care to acknowledge, group affiliation, none, don't ask, wait, 95 pounds, don't judge me, you'll regret it. Finally, we have Legionnaire, art by Todd Nock and Matt Erms. Uh, this character appears only in silhouette, and all of the information on the Who's Who page is redacted, including his or her supposed first appearance. We can see that the character is wearing a Legion of Superheroes flight ring, and in the serpent of the image, we see both the flight ring and the one used by 20th century time traveler Rip Hunter. Uh, it should be noted that Rip's time sphere was not transparent pre-crisis, but now it looks almost identical to the transparent time spheres used by the Legion of Superheroes. 
Final thoughts. I really loved this comic. You know, I, I loved the work that Jeff Johns did on Justice Society. Uh, that certainly was, in fact, that was probably my favorite Jeff Johns comic he ever did. Um, he has written some good comics, and he is a very good writer. Um, my main critique of Jeff Johns is that he apparently seems to think he's one of the best writers in comics ever, and that I, certainly doesn't seem to bear out. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, I Like, for example, Mark Wade. I To me, they're, they're comparable. You know, neither one is really inventing new forms of comic entertainment, but they're both great at... Uh, uh, doing stuff with, with older characters that, uh, um, you know, like bringing new life to them, writing them in a fresh manner, um, incorporating uh, new continuity and, and, and adapting that with the old characters. You know, they're both very good at that kind of thing. Um, I prefer Mark Wade's Flash to Jeff Johns's Flash. I thought the whole introduction of uh, Barry Allen's dead mother was unnecessary. I thought the character was already interesting and he didn't need, uh, you know, a, a potential um, fridging, uh, so to speak, um, to, to motivate him. Fridging is the term that, that was created uh, after uh, the Green Lantern Kyle Rayner's girlfriend was killed and stuffed into a fridge as a way of motivating him to be a better superhero. Uh, similarly, you know, Barry Allen's mo mother didn't need to be uh, retroactively revealed to have been murdered in his childhood uh, for him to be a great superhero. Um, not all heroes have, in real life, have tragedy. Sometimes, in fact, you, you need a solid foundation in order to, to get endure some of the crap that heroes have to go through. Now, it's just to say that you have to have that solid foundation. Now, there would be you know, people, like good things can come from tragedy, but it's not a requirement. But uh, uh, what Jeff Johns is doing with the new Golden Age is really enjoyable. Um, I really like how you can take uh, an image of the way things uh, were and then rework it. And now all of a sudden you've got like a brand new way of showing things uh, to, to readers and fans. And making them see things in a new light and, and in ways that they hadn't thought of before. Um, while still telling new stories. So this is a great approach to, to doing this. And... Uh, I don't, my biggest complaint about this particular comic is just that the individual, um, artists weren't associated with individual pages. I would like to know who drew what, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm familiar with Jerry Ordway, I've been reading Jerry Ordway comics for 40 years, or Todd Knock comics for 20 years. There are others, uh, you know, nothing against them, but they, 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 good art, you've got no problems with the art. If I were to become a fan of them, I'd need to know who did what. That is my, really you know, my only problem with this issue. But there is just so much stuff packed into these 48 pages. It is incredible. So I do plan on covering the 2020-2023 uh, Justice Society series. Um, I'll be, you know, because again, I mentioned comics hot off the today's shelves. Well, at the moment, there, in June of 2023, there is no Justice League comic. There uh, have been teases at that Justice League may uh, come out of out of this summer's uh, DC Comics crossover event, but nothing definitive has has been uh, put on the schedule. Uh, I mean, at least not for public consumption. I mean, maybe internally they know. Ooh, we're releasing the new Justice League, uh, you know, Transversal number seventy two or whatever whatever new version they're going to call it. Uh, well, we're going to release it in October of twenty three. Well, the solicits aren't that far out yet. Maybe they're planning on it, but we don't know yet. When it happens, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to share it with you. And I hope you're going to like what I have to say about it, good or bad. Um, you know, uh, I try to follow the mantra uh, that they use uh, from the aforementioned Fire and Water Podcast Network, find your joy. You know, Justice League comics, Justice Society comics, Star Trek comics, bring me joy. However... I'm also going to be honest with you. If I don't like something, I'm not going to say I like it. Uh, I'm not going to be unduly harsh. I'm not going to be nasty. Um, I will try to be uh, constructive with my criticism. But um, if I don't like it, I'll tell you. But if I do like it, or if I love it, I'll tell you that too. 
I love the new golden age number one. I'm enjoying the Justice Society of America 2023. I'm enjoying Stargirl the Lost Children 2023. And uh, in future episodes, uh, I'll talk about it with you. So uh, just remember, I have uh, previous episodes out there for you. Uh, there's, of course, the aforementioned uh, All-Star Comics number three with the first appearance of the JSA from 1940. That was in episode three of uh, the podcast. Uh, episode uh, 13 was the second part of my uh, discussion of the uh, uh, 1978 JLA JSA team up with uh, Ross Aitken, uh, where we talked about uh, JLA number 160. And then we have issue four, or issue episode 14, where I talked about uh, 1980s Star Trek number five from Marvel Comics. Coming up, we've got. Coming up, our next episode, we'll be covering a 2022's Star Trek Klingons, published by IDW. And that'll be an important one, because it really ties into the new Star Trek series that they started publishing last fall. Um, it, it has a lot of uh, material. I mean, it's not critical that you read it, but it definitely um, brings a whole new context to the story. And so, uh, I, I'm going to talk about it and share it with you, so hopefully you can... Uh, uh, factor that into our upcoming discussions of uh, uh, the, the current IDW Star Treks. Uh, in the following episode, uh, here on Justice Fridays, we will be talking, I'll, I'll be talking, you'll be listening, about 1960's The Brave and the Bold, number 29, with the second ever appearance of the Justice League of America, where they fight the uh, villain Sotar. The Weapons Master. If that name doesn't seem familiar to you, it's because Sotar has not appeared since 1960's The Brave and the Bold, number 29. Um, this one, uh, uh, just believe it or not, I don't know how many of you follow the, the trends of how uh, many views each episode gets, but I've gotten more views on episode 5, where I covered the first appearance of the JLA from Brave the Bowl number 28, that every other video I've done combined. That's how much people liked it. So, yes, I will definitely be dipping back into the Silver Age well for that. So, um, hope you like uh, my past episodes. I hope you like my upcoming episodes. I hope you like this episode. And if you do, please click like, please click subscribe, and keep on Justice Trekking.